All right, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm Eric Camino, I'm PPMD's Vice President of Research and Clinical Innovation. Um, I wanted to thank all of you for joining us today for this webinar with Edgewise Therapeutics. And they've joined us to discuss their investigational product, Edge 5506, for individuals living with Becker muscular dystrophy. Um, I'm joined today by Alan Russell, the co-founder and CSO, uh, Chief Scientific Officer at Edgewise Therapeutics, Joanne Donovan, their Chief Medical Officer, and Abby Bronson, their Vice President of Patient Advocacy. Um, over the years, we've seen you know, a really heavy focus of therapeutic development uh, for Duchenne patients, and we recognize that our Becker families are often underserved in our drug development landscape. So we're really excited uh, to be hosting Edgewise today um, for this webinar. You know, as a company, they have taken a, a focused approach to treating both individuals with Becker um, and Duchenne. So this is something that's, that we think is really exciting to start seeing more uh, companies join the space, um, working on um, developing therapies for those with Becker. And this is something PPMD has also been expanding our focus on. Um, if you look, our, our recent update uh, to the community-led guidance that we had previously published um, and updated with new learnings over the past few years um, and submitted to the FDA at the close of 2022, one of the pieces in there that we talk about is, you know, kind of breaking away from some of the, the segmenting of Duchenne and Becker and looking at this disease as a spectrum of dystrophinopathy. Um, and that is something, you know, if you're interested, we do have publicly available on, on the website. If you kind of search for guidance, it's something you can come across pretty easily. Um, and then trying to take a bit more of a focused approach as we engage with, with Becker families. So, you know, at our conference last year, again, at Dallas this year, we'll hold some sessions that are kind of exclusively focused um, on Becker. And we really hope to engage with, with more of our Becker um, families and individuals uh, through this process. Um, and we know that there's a lot of challenges still to be met in furthering kind of our understanding of Becker natural history and clinical trial design, and that there are you know, very unique burdens um, for those that you know, live with Becker daily. And those, you know, that's gonna be different than necessarily what some of our, our Duchenne individuals um, live with. And it's an important that we you know, learn that, capture that um, and, and share that knowledge. So, um, you know, those of you who do have Becker and are interested in participating in natural history studies and interventional studies, you know, that participation is really critical to moving the field forward. So we're really grateful for all of you um, who do have the time to do that and, and make yourself available for that. Um, and, you know, hope you, uh, you know, enjoy this webinar um, and look forward to some, a number of different um, clinical trials that are kind of on, on the verge um, for those with Becker. Uh, as a reminder, we are recording this webinar, so um, you can view it uh, probably sometime again in the next week, share it with anyone, um, you know, friends, family, who this might be relevant to. We're also gonna have an open Q&A at the end of the presentation. So if you have questions, please um, enter, enter them into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get through as many of those questions as we can. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Abby and uh, she can uh, start uh, the talk today on EDGE 5506. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really glad to be here, and I want to thank PPMD for organizing this opportunity. I think a lot of what Eric said is really exciting. If I were, if this were a live meeting, I would start it out by asking everybody who, who lives with Becker to raise their hand just so we know who was in the audience. But um, Yes, I'm here with our Chief Scientific Officer, Alan Russell, and our Chief Medical Officer, Joanne Donovan, and we're going to talk about EDGE 5506. Now my screen is not moving forward. There we go. Um, this is our forward-looking statement. You've probably seen these. The most important thing to remember is that we will be talking about an investigational compound, EDGE 5506 and it has not been approved in any territory anywhere. So Edgewise was founded in 2017, and it was founded, and actually Alan can speak to this because he was here from the very beginning being one of the co-founders, um, but really focused on developing novel therapies for Becker and Duchenne and other muscular dystrophies, but specifically Becker and Duchenne. Um, we wanted to build something, design something that was really convenient, was um, 
and able to be uh, be taken regardless of, of all the mutations. There are so many mutation specific therapies out there. Um, and a little bit echoing to what Eric said at the beginning and some of the learnings that we have found as we've been working in the Becker muscular dystrophy space is that there is some natural history data, they're limited. And from that, you know, we, we have realized that Becker, it's truly a serious dystrophinopathy. Um, it has, it's a, a variable clinical course as does many of the other muscular dystrophies. Um, but once individuals start declining, it's an ir irreversible decline um, and they lose muscle and their disease progresses. And that is something that, that is universal. We've done a lot of um, qualitative work, something called PED, patient experience data, gathering patient experience da data to understand the, the, the lived experience of those um, who have Buc Becker muscular dystrophy. And it is not mild Duchenne. Uh, living with Becker, there are multiple challenges that these individuals face. Um, and I think it's it's very, you know, more of an adult disease than it is a, a, a pediatric disease. And that in and of itself is a different experience. So we're working very hard to continue to listen to the community and understand this lived experience. Um, but in, in the similarity is that in both Becker and Duchenne, once the lack of dystrophin or the partial presence of dystrophin as in Becker, um, once that is there, the contraction induced injury in those fast muscle fibers, it's, it's what drives the disease progression. So that is similar between BMD and DMD. Um, and as you hear, hear through this talk, EDGE 5506 modulates this fast myosin, and we believe that it can protect muscle fibers from, from that injury from everyday activity. Um, so it's really, I think, an exciting time for those living with Becker. There is there are four, as Eric mentioned, there's four clinical trials right now. There's two interventionals. I mean, interventional being there's a drug that's get, being studied. So one is Vimorolone and one is what we're looking at. And then there's two different natural history studies. So it's really, you know, there's a lot of focus in Becker. It's just starting but if we all work together and we all fill these trials and we all learn together, um, I think that we can make a lot of progress. So I'm, I'm really excited. So now I believe, I, oh, these are just the trials that we have ongoing right now. So ARCH and, I, and all of these, I think we'll be talking about a little bit further in the presentation, but ARCH is a 24 month open label, meaning that there is no placebo, no dummy drug given. Um, and that is for adults with Becker, and they were the ones who were in our phase one, plus a few more. Canyon is a Becker uh, study that's enrolling both ambulatory adolescents and adults, and that is randomized, meaning that you get assigned to either treatment or the dummy, the dummy placebo, the placebo arm. And then Lynx is our Duchenne trial. So now I'm going to pass it over to Alan, and he's going to take you through the science. Thanks very much, Abby. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background and then uh, a couple of just kind of conceptual uh, preclinical. So before we got into patient's data, just to give you an idea of what the compound does. And then I'll hand it over to Joanne and tell you about some clinical data. So as, as Abby just mentioned, um, some muscle fibers are more susceptible to damage due to a lack of functional dystrophin. So whether uh, dystrophin is absent in the context of Duchenne or mutated in the context of Becker, uh, what, what we've uh, observed is that fast skeletal muscle fibers, which makes up about half of your muscle, are more susceptible to injury than the slow ones. So that's essentially the, the light meat on a chicken versus the dark meat. And we're made up, as I mentioned, 50% fast, 50% slow. We've made an investigational therapy, EDG5506 or EDGE5506, that's designed to protect those fast fibers. Uh, it's a, it's a, a mechanical solution, if you like, rather than a genetic one. So it doesn't matter what mutation that you have, it should protect your muscles. And in, in animal models of Becker and Duchenne, 
5506 protected those susceptible muscle fibers and improved overall muscle health quality and protected that muscle. And I'll show you a little bit of that data in a second. Next slide. So you're used to seeing dystrophin in the context of a picture, kind of like that thing on the left-hand side, right? Where it's this long stick-like thing that connects the inside to the outside of the muscle. But of course, muscle contracts. So what I've done is I've turned the dystrophin complex into those green stripes there. So they connect the inside to the outside of the muscle and thus connect fibers. Now, people like to think of muscle contracting like this, but each individual fiber has separate innovation. So one fiber can contract and others don't have to. And you can see now what that complex is doing. It's connecting that contracting fiber to the non-contracting ones and stabilizing that fiber. Now, if you have no dystrophin or if the dystrophin is mutated, um, the body tries to put up with that by upregulating other stuff. But the end product is now these fibers are no longer connected. And that means that when that central fiber contracts now, it's all on its own. It's not supported by the ones around it. And that leads to excess stress. And when muscle fibers get stressed, the membrane gets stressed. And that causes uh, the activation of pathways that snip those fibers up. It happens to all of us when we go to the gym in some form or other. So when you do exercise, particularly lengthening exercise where you extend your muscles while contracting them, you will injure your muscle fibers like this. And that's how you actually get stronger is part of the adaptive process. But of course, if you have Becker muscular dystrophy, uh, that process is going on too rapidly and the body can't keep up with it. And that's what leads to the stress and the inflammation and the fibrosis and the muscle loss that eventually causes the weakness that, that we're so interested in. Now, here's the therapeutic concept, if you like. I just showed you that contraction causes this excess degeneration and that fast fibers are more likely to be injured than slow fibers when you do exercise. So what we're hoping to do is change that relationship by changing how the muscle contracts. So if you can limit the, the injurious contraction, you will in, limit the injury, right? So what, what we've designed is 5506, this is a small molecule, it's an oral medication, that when you take it, it subtly changes how your muscles can contract, uh, and that changes how much they can injure themselves. And you see this in action on this slide. So now, this is a Duchenne muscle. We have similar data in Becker muscle. You can see on the left-hand side, this is a non-treated muscle. So this is from the mouse with muscular dystrophy. As that muscle is contracting, the membrane is getting stressed because there's no dystrophy complex. And now what you can see is just like I showed you in the graphic, the muscle fibers are stressed and they're getting chopped up. And, and that's manifesting in the appearance of these kind of blobs. And each one of those blobs is essentially the whole muscle fiber that's been snipped up and has crunched into a ball. So you can see as that muscle fiber is contracting, those balls are in, accumulating uh, and the number of snip muscle fibers is increasing. On the right hand side, we treated the muscle for one hour with 5506. It's changed how that muscle is contracting. It's limiting the stress on that muscle. And now you can see that while the muscle is still contracting, it's not getting injured anymore. So we're trying to change the relationship between use and injury, essentially snipping the disease uh, at its very core so that it can't propagate that muscle injury that causes all the problems. Next slide. Now, when muscle gets injured, Proteins leak out of that muscle into your bloodstream. And you're probably familiar with things like creatine kinase. You might even be familiar with something like myoglobin, which is elevated. We're interested in a bigger picture to muscle injury. And that's why we talk about other proteins like fast skeletal muscle troponin there on the right hand side. And what that is, it's another protein that's also present in muscle but of most interest to us, it's only present in fast fibers. So we see CK, creatine kinase is a really important biomarker, but we also talk about things like myoglobin 
and fast troponin, because if you're stopping the leak of one thing, you should stop the leak of all of the things. And we like to give you a more aggregate view of what's happening to your muscle, especially when focused on those fast fibers. So now what I'll do is I'll hand over to Joanne and she'll tell you about some of the clinical data uh, that we have so far. Hello there. Very nice to speak with you all today. So what we are, are doing is basically addressing this problem of the lack of dystrophin causing contraction-induced damage in the muscle. And this happens both in Becker and Duchenne. So we are learning from one, uh, from studies in one and being able to apply it to the other as well. And you've heard, you know, these, these get lumped together. And as Abby said, it is important to look at Becker as a distinct disease. There are, there are differences in the way that the, the damage occurs uh, to across the muscles, for example. And um, as there is less functional dystrophin, we kind of go over towards the right and the muscle damage uh, increases. So our approach is basically to protect the muscle and to protect it from breakdown because of the lack of functional dystrophin. And that's true regardless of, of mutation as well. So what we did was we went into um, clinical trials in phase one. And when we are trying to talk about, well, how do we look at this? How do we measure whether dr the drug has an effect? We'll look at the biomarkers, like Alan explained, the, the muscles that become leaky and leak out not just CK, but other biomarkers. Um, we also measure function. And the North Star Ambulatory Assessment is a basically a snapshot of uh, function in individuals that are ambulatory. So it looks at two things. One is whether the person can do that activity. And the second is whether or not they can do it, but because of weakness, there is an adjustment. They compensate for it. So for example, in standing up from the floor, do you need to, to use your arms on your legs to push yourself up? Um, and so there, the, each one of these activities is scored either zero, can't do it at all, one can do it, but are, are compensating in some way, or two. So we get up to a score of 34. That means that all of those things can be done. It's used in clinical trials in Becker. It's also used in clinical trials in Duchenne. And it's used to monitor things over time. And basically, in a clinical trial, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to understand whether a drug can change the progression, can change motor function changing over time. So there are other ways of looking at this too. And one of them is to look with MRI at the muscle um, basically replacement with fat and fibrosis. So as Alan said, what, what dystrophin does is it protects the muscle from damage. If the muscle is damaged, gradually it gets replaced with fat and fibrosis. So there's less muscle, there's less function. And what we what these data are are from uh, an Italian group that has looked at people over up to five years, uh, people with Becker. And basically the the different colors here, from the green at the top to the red at the bottom, is degrees of fat replacement. So it basically mirrors how much muscle they have. At the top, basically intact muscle. At the bottom, it's largely replaced with fat and fibrosis. And that correlates with the score on the North Star scale. So at the top, 34 intact, and then at the bottom, basically moving from ambulatory to non-ambulatory. So what happens over a year? If you look at the folks at the top that have intact muscle, they're not changing very much. The ones that have already started to lose muscle, so in the orange and the red and the, even the yellow, they go down. 
So in a clinical trial, what we're looking for is, to, in order to be able to show the drug works, is to look at change with the drug compared to change with a placebo. And that's how we need to do it to develop a drug and bring it to FDA for registration. So that means that for the trials, we're looking at those folks that are progressing. Now we started in our phase one trial, the first time basically in, in humans, we looked at unaffected adults and we also um, included uh, a number of folks with Becker muscular dystrophy who all get gold stars for coming to a phase one unit, living in basically a uh, a, a dorm kind of situation, food's probably not great. And they, they stayed there for two and a half weeks while the clinical staff there watched them carefully when the drug was given for two weeks to understand how does the drug work? What are the side effects? And that we found, first of all, safety is the most important thing in this kind of a trial. When the trial, when the, do, the drug was dosed for two weeks, it was well tolerated. Um, the most common side effects that, that were typically in the first few days uh, were drowsiness um, and, a, and a funny feeling called, called, we ended up calling it dizziness, um, but it, was pro it probably had more to do with getting used to muscles. So, safety point of view. So now we know what to look for in later trials. It is um, given, we look at the, how the drug is absorbed and it's given as an oral tablet once a day with or without food. So that's important to understand for the future. And we also, um, these guys were, were, were wonderful enough. We were able to do muscle biopsies and that gave us very important information about the drug, that it is getting to the muscle. In fact, there's a hundred times more drug in the muscle than there is in the bloodstream. And that tells us that it's getting to where it needs to be and it needs to get to where it needs to be to protect the muscle. So there's a lot of important stuff that we get very early on from a, a relatively small number of, of patients. So, now we're going into trials. We've dosed folks here for over six months. We This was an, an open label study. So everyone knows that they are getting EDG 5506. There were 12 patients enrolled, including the seven that uh, were in the phase one study uh, and five additional uh, individuals. We look at these biomarkers. So creatine kinase, CK, it went down, uh, went down within the first month, stayed down through six months. We looked at this marker called fast skeletal muscle troponin. And Alan told you there are certain kinds of fibers that are more affected, that are tend to be damaged earlier um, in Becker and Duchenne. And so this is very specific to those. It tells us whether the drug is what we call on target. And the fast skeletal muscle troponin from these cells was down 84%. So that tells us that, that not only is the drug getting to where it needs to be, but it's doing something to protect the muscle in terms of causing the leakage of these proteins from the muscle. So that's very encouraging. We then went on to look at, well, what's happening in terms of, of, of these folks and their muscle function over time? And we knew that this isn't enough. This, this is a small number of patients, but we looked at this North Star ambulatory assessment. And what we found was that over the six months, these, these gentlemen who were in the range that I showed you, they would be decreasing over time. And so the orange line shows what we would have predicted from those kind of natural history studies. Um, so instead of decreasing, we saw them actually trending up, which was very encouraging. We actually were, were very pleased to see this um, uh, over that period of time compared to what we would have thought would have happened. And we got to flip back a couple there. I guess this is, yes, this is the, the next one. So that's 
So that was very encouraging. And that gives us the information that we need to move into a phase two study, a larger study at multiple sites across the country. This study is um, the Canyon study. It is 14 months, um, it is a 12 month study. There's a screening period at the beginning. And it looks to tell us whether how EDG 5506 affects safety, how well tolerated it is, what happens to biomarkers of muscle damage, and what happens to function in individuals living with Becker. We enrolled uh, uh, men uh, and young men aged 12 to 50, so adolescents and adults, um, and with a mutation in the, the DMD gene, the dystrophin gene, um, and as well within certain parameters. And so these would be folks that we would anticipate would be on that downward curve so that they had significant in, impairment already. Um, this is the, the um, we've learned from the previous trial and as clinical development goes on, we're, we're able to move the, the times that people need to come into the clinic out further. So it starts out with every month, for example, in this trial. And then as we get to nine months, say, then it's back, it's out to three months. So we try to reduce the number of visits through that period of time. There's a screening visit. Some of these visits are now phone visits um, that we are, are changing to. Um, we ask when they, these um, individuals come into the clinic, um, do some functional assessments like the North Star. Uh, we include an MRI in this study, um, blood tests. There's no muscle biopsy. We're, we're done with that. And then there's uh, at-home elements like looking with a a pedometer to see how what activity level they have uh, in in daily life, basically. Um, so that gives us more information. Now we have a number of sites that are enrolling in the United States. We actually have a couple sites, uh, several sites in Europe, in the UK, and um, uh, the Netherlands. And these are the sites that are actively uh, recruiting. Now, obviously. These sites aren't going to be next door to many of you. So what we do is we provide travel services. So we have a concierge uh, level, hopefully, uh, travel uh, group that provides, that minimizes the burden as much as we can so that it should be cost neutral uh, to folks. So that means getting people their prepaying tickets, uh, giving them a, a, a a credit card to pay for incidentals, parking, tolls, things like that, and food, uh, whatever it, it, you need to kind of cover those expenses, because it shouldn't be you guys, you know, paying for the, for the study, we should be covering that. And that's, that's what we, we do, uh, and help uh, organize all of that to get to the different sites. Um, so, um, what Abby and her team have, have done is really, you know, we're all committed to reducing the, the burden for patients because without patients, you know, to be involved in studies, we don't find out more about the drug. And ultimately, that means that down the road, we're not getting the drug to you back to you um, to, to help potentially. Um, so uh, Abby and her team are very engaged and try to understand what the issues are. That's why we've, we've made changes as we've gone along to reduce the, the trial burden, to reduce the barriers um, to um, uh, participating in the trials. As I mentioned, providing support services um, for participants, uh, trying to enroll uh, more sites. There's actually more sites coming on board um, to ease the travel uh, burden for our participation. Um, so we're active um, in, in trying to do all of, all of those things. So to summarize, we are developing this um, for Becker, um, for uh, Duchenne, and um, this is a drug that's taken orally once a day um, to preserve and, and potentially to improve function uh, by preserving muscle. Muscle has regenerative cap capabilities um, and can, can we uh, move things in that direction. Looking at patients with any mutation, 
Right now, we're looking at ambulatory patients. In the future, um, we would hope to expand this to younger ages, to older ages, um, to prevent damage to muscle by protecting the most susceptible uh, muscle fibers. And we see this as something that could be used alone um, or in combination with other approaches um, for uh, dystrophinopathies. And, and really to try to address the very, the first thing that happens in this disease, which is that when contraction happens, the muscle gets injured. So can we stop that at the very root cause of, of the disease? So we're studying this. Um, Abby mentioned there are also um, trials, there's natural history trials uh, uh, that, under, that help us understand better and can help us design trials better. So they're all important, both the therapeutic trials as well as natural history studies that help us understand better and interpret the data better. So um, if, if you know, there's we there are um, uh, ways of finding out. We'll help, be happy to direct you, uh, clintrials.gov, to look for studies that are um, not just ours but others that are um, available. So to kind of summarize, um, we get Becker is a serious dystrophinopathy. Um, there is um, a variable clinical course. Some people, it's age. I didn't, didn't stress that at the time. So it's not so much age, but current function. And But once people start to lose muscle mass and decline, that doesn't come back that's irreversible in terms of losing muscle and, and progression of disease. Um, we've heard from you, Becker poses multiple challenges in daily life. It, it's different for adults than for kids. And we are, are listening to the community. We understand that it's critical to listen to, to folks to understand and to assess things in clinical trials that would impact their, their experience. In, in dystrophinopathies, contraction-induced injury is a key aspect of the disease process. And we believe that modulating fast myosin, which is where the, the, the drug is targeted, these fast muscle fibers, that can protect uh, muscle fibers from this contraction-induced uh, injury. And what we've seen so far is very encouraging because we've seen that EDG 5506 uh, can decrease biomarkers of muscle injury in individuals with Becker. And we have uh, the Canyon study that, that I spoke about is underway. It's enrolling. Um, and um, uh, we also have a study in Duchenne that's enrolling. And um, we uh, hope we'll, we will be back and, and uh, to continue to share data um, as, as we move ahead. Um, here's uh, how you can uh, reach us in particular for questions and follow us uh, in all the, the appropriate social media. So thank you so much for listening and we are happy to, to answer questions. I've seen some questions flick by on, on yeah. there, but I can't. Uh, <laughs> no, no can't, problem. Can't, I can't talk and read at the same time, I guess. Yeah. No, thank you all three. That was a really great presentation. And yeah, happy to see some questions rolling in. So if you have questions, please submit them to the chat. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one was asking about um, the ARCH study. So, mm -hmm. you know, as the, they noted that the last results were yeah. in October of 2022, mm -hmm. um, you know, are you following these patients still? Uh, is there any yeah. new data from them or that we can expect um, to see? Yep. In the last couple of months, they all got over a year. And so we will be sharing those data in the, in the near future. So um, yeah, we, we measure things less as, as they move out, they come in less to the clinic. So the next critical point is at a year, and we'll be, be sharing that. Um, so stay tuned. There may even be a webinar on that. So, um, so with regards to um, the Canyon study, uh, we did have a question on can a participant in Canyon be on steroids? 
So we are not, we realize that, that folks are on steroids. Um, there it, it's less common, um, but um, we understand that. What we are to, one of the things in clinical trials is to look at a relatively homogeneous group of, of patients. So we're kind of looking at, at, at trying to maximize the chance of success there. We are, we think that we believe it will work with steroids. Um, we're looking at it in Duchenne in kids on steroids. So we'll get that information from how it works on top of steroids it, with um, other trials as well. Um, we actually, Alan uh, can speak to uh, what happens in the lab and there's some encouraging data that we presented at MDA there. And this kind of, uh, in many ways, feeds in. There was a question about cardiomyopathy as well. Um, so, yeah, we, of course, cardiomyopathy is a, is a big part of Becker muscular dystrophy. We don't specifically target that muscle. We target the fast skeletal muscle. But uh, we have some really nice preclinical data uh, in more severe versions of muscular dystrophy. Um, the DBA2 MDX to be technical, which has cardiomyopathy. And when, when we give those mice 5506, they actually get better cardiac outcomes. So less fibrosis uh, uh, and better looking hearts. So uh, our current thought is that by protecting the fast fibers, um, you actually have a knock-on effect to the heart. Now, who knows in people whether that will be the same it certainly won't be harmful to the heart, and we're hoping, and um, we'll be monitoring those hearts, uh, that, that we may have a knock-on beneficial effect. Mm -hmm. That's encouraging. Um, and yeah, for, for anyone who is, who's unfamiliar, we have a lot of different animal models for studying uh, Duchenne and Becker, and so there's always different ones that can be used to try and, and, and ask different questions. Um, just as a quick follow-on to that one, because although um, you know, this, is, this is where we hope to get with Becker, um, you know, there's only one other study with an investigational product with Vomorolone. Is there an exclusion criteria if, if a patient was on another investigational product? I know that's not as relevant at the moment within mm -hmm. Becker. Um, we see that a lot in the Duchenne space, but, um, you know, hopefully yeah. we get there. Yeah, I, um, it would be great if there, there are more uh, agents out there. Um, in general, clinical trials look at one investigational agent at a time because it's before it's approved, we don't know all of the, the, the side effects. So it's important to ask one question at a time. Um, and the FDA encourages that, 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 that we're only looking at one uh, in, uh, treatment at a, at a time. Um, eventually, yes, um, we would want to know that. I think on the steroid question, somebody asked about the, the five milligrams a day uh, for a low dose of, of steroids. So there are some people that are on it not for a, a low dose, not for uh, dystrophinopathy. So if they were on it for adrenal reasons, they could be in the study for that. Uh, but they can't be on a therapeutic dose for muscular dystrophy. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, and, and this is more of a um, who best to, to reach out to. Um, so we have, we have two different uh, people in the chat kind of asking specific questions around right. participation. One kind of from um, travel challenges that might, um, could, could maybe is preventing their ability to participate. Another one um, looking at kind of where there's some age restrictions and, and, and flexibility. And I don't know who is the best person to reach out to um, for those families to, to try and contact and, and have that discussion. So the study mailbox is, is very helpful. I, I noticed somebody asked about, well, are there sites in California? Can you do? Um, and the answer is yes, there is a site in California, uh, soon to be more sites in California, actually. Um, so uh, that's something that um, if you write the study mailbox, we can put them, put you in touch with with folks. And and the only the reason for that is because 
like some sites may not be recruiting or temporarily not recruiting. So that that's why we kind of push people in that direction. So yeah, and that that mailbox, that email address is right here on the screen. That studies at edgewisetx.com. So just write in and ask. Yeah, we can make sure to drop a link to it in when we when we post the recording. Um, with the the patients in the phase one study, um, did you see any you know side effects, any adverse events during that six month um, period, um, and, or could you expand on the ones that you did kind of mention in the in the talk? Yeah, the um, most common side effects um, were uh, sleepiness and dizziness, and they happen typically in the first few days. Um, or actually when we, we changed the dose, we went up during the course of the study. They tend to be um, things that people get used to. And what we're actually doing is uh, advising them to take the drug uh, before bedtime. And then this is only something that seems to happen a, an hour or so after uh, dosing at the beginning, um, not long-term. And that there hasn't been really any any issue with that. Uh, in terms of people staying on the drug or so. So yeah, well tolerated. And there was a question if all the ARCH participants are still, have, have made, stayed on, on. We uh, haven't had drug. to, we haven't had to reduce the dose. Nobody has gone off for side effects. So. And they'll be, they're, they're past a year now and they'll be heading into their second year of treatment. And um, in the, the Canyon study, are all of the individuals on uh, the same dose or is it going to be um, a, different doses for different participants. Yep. So there's two different doses. Um, and there is also that we're looking at, there is also um, for the adolescents is, is a lower, is a different dose. So for weight adjusted, basically. Um, and are you planning an, an extension study um, yes. following that? Yes, yes. Um, we, and we, we always, so the reason we don't put that in at the beginning is it it becomes more complicated. You know, this is the first long term study that that you are are doing, and you're asking people to then uh, approve a study for you know two three years. So we it, we do it in a stepwise fashion. But yes, we are very actively. We've got a protocol written for the extension study and and are in the process of of working through that. So. And the extension study would be everybody, whether they were on placebo or active drug, will get active drug in that part of the study. And, and maybe you're still working on this, but is this something where everyone in that open label would go to um, the same dose at that point of whatever was tolerable? Yeah, we would choose, they would, we would make sure that they were on the best dose. Yes, well, working on that. Um, and then there was just a, a question about timing. Is it, you know, is it possible to start, um, edge 5506, you know, too early before they start to see some of the, the, the damage, um, although mm -hmm. we kind of know in the course of this disease, there's, there's damage happening in the background, you know, from a very mm -hmm. early age, whether Becker or, or Duchenne, that, that damage is, a, is occurring, mm -hmm. but and so the uh, one of the reasons is to include the 12 to 17 year olds, and there we're actually including. Um, we're not requiring them to have a specific measurement of the north star, and most of those guys are at, at close to the maximum. But we'll be able to see whether the biomarkers change, whether they tolerate it, and the idea in a clinical trial is okay. I've got a group that I can I can measure the difference between placebo and the active drug. And there are other groups where I maybe I can't measure that difference because they are not changing, but I can look at other things. I can look at safety. I can look at how much drug is, is on board and I can look at whether the biomarkers change. So all that down the road would then be supportive for uh, having the drug be available to a broader group of, of patients, so. Yeah. Just because you got, what we're thinking. Just because you got Becker and you're not manifesting any major kind of debilitating weakness doesn't mean your your muscles aren't getting injured, right? So the quicker you can get onto something like this, the better. Um, 
you know, that's why we have to do the clinical trials to, to get the scores of efficacy and then we can move into yeah. populations. And that and that's something that we've heard from from the, all the patient work that I've done is they'll say, I didn't know I needed help until I needed help. So then it's almost too late. You wish you had done something earlier. So thank you. That's yeah, all very yeah. important. Um, and then we did have a question around study start. So for Canyon. Um, study is actively uh, in, enrolling, mm -hmm. um, but and, and I think as you mentioned, because they there was also a question with that of any side effects when when drug was stopped. But I think to date, all of um, have you had any yeah. individuals with withdraw or all have stayed, but in both Arch and Canyon have, have remained on yeah. on therapy. So in Canyon, either we have not had anybody discontinue for for side effects. We wouldn't expect that there would be anything when you come off the drug. It, it, there shouldn't be any any rebound from a yeah. kind of a science point of view. Those people who were in the in that early study, in the first time in human test oh, yeah. center, they did go off the drug for yeah. a couple of months before coming back for Arch, and we didn't see any negative yeah. consequences. That's good. That's right. Somebody asked about younger kids too. And I, I think that's, you know, I find that very difficult when somebody asks me, well, why can't my eight-year-old be in it? Um, and because we think, as Alan said, yeah, it can't be early and too early. What this is one of those places where the Duchenne trial and the Becker trial complement one another. So we are looking in the Duchenne study at younger kids down to four. So we'll have that information. Um, the first thing is to figure out like how to dose in younger kids. What's the right dose? So we'll be understanding that from the younger kids in, in, in with Duchenne and can then translate that um, to the Becker population as well. And that, that that does as well get to a you know a bigger conversation that we sometimes have in the the drug development space of you know is is age really the one of the relevant markers for that verse you know as you showed your natural history data that kind of once they get away from that ceiling of thirty four and start to have you know thirty two and below you know maybe some of those factors are are much more relevant in in you being able to detect change in a year than using a marker mm -hmm. like like age mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then there was a, a question around um, the possibility. So this is, you know, not even more of a company focused question, but I, I still think it's it's interesting and relevant here because we don't sometimes, you know, the, the therapies that are being developed in our space are um, mutation specific genetic therapies, and they are going to have a very specific kind of use case. And here there was a question of, you know, is, is this something given what you've seen in terms of biomarker data for Becker patients, you're working in the Duchenne population. Um, is EDGE 5506 something that you could see being broadened to other um, muscular dystrophies as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody else. Alan. Oh, I'll do that one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is a structural fix. So if you have some kind of a myopathy where you get excess injury when you use your muscles, then you're fair game for the compound. And we're actually testing uh, that concept in a small focus single center site in Copenhagen under the purview of Dr. John Visting uh, in limb girdle 2i, that's the R9 limb girdle and McCardle disease as well, which is a metabolic myopathy. Now, they're just kind of example indications where we might broaden out, but as the as the questioner rightly put, there's a number of sarcoglycanopathies, for instance, that are also uh, injure muscles when they contract. So, so this is a potentially kind of broadening of the interest uh, for 5506. And to, and to add to that, Alan, we wrote the Speak Foundation is the limb girdle, the, the, the PPMD of the limb girdle world. And we wrote an article about how EDGE 5506 might apply in some of the limb girdles. So I think that was the fall or winter, I think it was the winter issue. And if anyone wants to link to it, I can get it. But that explains sort of, you know, this, this mechanism and how it would apply to the limb girdles. No, it's, it's always great when we can have kind of shared learnings across these different diseases to help kind of, you know, rise all ships. Um, yeah. 
and, and I think the, the logical follow on and someone kind of beat me to the question here, which is what about female carriers? We've obviously, uh, PPMD has, has supported some studies with carriers and we have now the carrier clinic at um, UPenn and kind of sometimes it's even feels a little bit further back in terms of what we know of carriers than even our, our Becker population in terms of getting to natural history, getting an understanding of the type of clinical outcome measures that could be used. But you know, this seems like something as well that could, um, you know, if it has a very uh, a, a tolerable safety profile, you know, could, could benefit um, carriers that are manifesting some type of muscle um, symptoms. Yeah. Um, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to submit them. I think we've got through most of the questions. Um, I, I there was a comment in here that you know that uh, the presentation of kind of how uh, dystrophin you know links the fibers and actually um, works in muscle was one of the clearest they've seen. So you know, kudos to you all. I do think that's an important piece to to talk about though when we think about um, small molecule drugs like Edge five five zero six that you know, we often will term something downstream um, that doesn't mean it's it's lesser than, it means it's addressing a different kind of, uh, you know, uh, aspect of, of the disease. And a lot of patients, whether with Duchenne who have no functional dystrophin or in the case of Becker have this these truncated shortened dystrophins, they're, they're still, you know, functional and maintaining function over time um, in that absence or with kind of these modified versions of it. And so, you know, that there can be benefit from these type of, of therapies, even if they're not addressing addressing that root cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Eric, it's, it's a common thing that we get. Ah, you're just changing how muscle contracts. You're not disease modifying. Uh, and, and it's not as interesting as genetic replacement, right? But the as you saw in the graphic, the root problem from not having the gene or having a mutated gene is that when the muscle contracts, it gets injured. So by using 5506, we directly do exactly the same thing as having dystrophin does. It stops the muscle getting injured when you have the compound uh, in you, right? So, so we, we strongly believe that this is a really interesting therapy that's potentially disease modifying. And, and that's why we're so excited about these trials. Yeah. yeah. And uh, another question around... Um, kind of your thoughts on, on, I guess, the regulatory aspect, um, kind of what is your timeline or, or pathway? Are you thinking this is something you would go for accelerated approval? Is this something where you use your phase two data to kind of inform a more, a, a pivotal phase three, kind of our traditional mm -hmm. gold standard placebo controlled trial? How are you all kind of thinking about um, your development? Yeah. We basically want to move this as fast as we can, and we're very encouraged by the data that we have. So I would say stay tuned uh, because we are looking to, to move this rapidly into a, a pivotal trial, a, a potentially a registrational trial. Uh, so we're we're on the same page as try to how do we get this yeah. to FDA and we are we have fast track with FDA so that gives us the opportunity to to talk with them more um and and move this ahead and you know they are very interested this is a different new disease for them right they they, they probably think they know a whole lot about D uh, Duchenne now, appropriately so, because they've had so many folks in front of them. But this is a new disease, and they need to understand what the issues are, and that there isn't anything out there for you guys now. No, and importantly too, it's it's you know on on us as um, patient advocates, as as companies as well, to help educate the regulators on what it's like to live with Becker. Um, some of the measurements too, as as well, you know, you talked about the MRI data and, and showing that and how that can show some of the the functional changes that that we see and you know educating regulators around what that means um, in these diseases is really important so that way as you mm -hmm. use and collect that data we can you know show show whether um, these uh, how these drugs are working mm -hmm. yeah. um, all right um, I think that's uh, the last of the questions we, that I saw come through Eric, we have one last second. Well, yeah. We had a question from Western in North Carolina. Western, you're a front and center for the study. Yeah. Uh, I would suggest you send an email to studies at Edgewise 
tx.com. And there's a question about participants being given placebo in Canyon. Joanne, you want to just give some information? Yeah. So the, the two participants get EDG 5506 for every one. So you've got a thir two thirds chance of, of getting it. The placebo is for is a one year period, admittedly. That's so we can see the difference and be able to go to FDA and show them that they and the um and after that, the, in the um, open label, then everybody gets the active drug, EDG 5506. No, thanks for clarifying. Um, all right. Well, yeah, so if, if you want to share this with um, any friends or family members who you think uh, would uh, benefit from seeing this presentation, um, it, will, it is being recorded. Um, we'll have it up uh, on the website probably within the next week. Um, so keep your eyes out for that. Um, if you have any additional questions, again, um, studies at edgewisetx.com, uh, that email there, um, please, you, know, you can send questions there. You can ask some questions to PPMD. Um, but I wanted to thank everyone from Edgewise for joining us today. Um, really appreciated the, the presentation and taking the time to answer all of the, the community questions. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.